This comes from a question from somebody on Reddit who was getting frustrated with their drawing and painting um, in the context of this landscape. The main issue being value. The question is, what do I do with value? How do I get better at it? Why does this look flat? Um, how do I get a sense of light? And um, from there, potentially, how do I set myself up to work with color? These are all great questions. And I actually like this study a lot. I think it's a very good start. The composition's nice. It kind of gives you this like uh, window that you're looking into. Um, there's the potential for a lot of contrast. There's already a pretty full value range in it, which is really good. Um, but yeah, there there might be something missing. And you know, if, there, if it's not something you want, then you need to make some changes. What I like to do is start with a very small study, like a five by five, five by seven study, once I decide on the composition anyway. And then go in with exactly four values, no more than that. If I go for any more than that for just a basic study, then I might as well just be working on the final draft. Um, so first I like to start with the ground and get that laid out and some major trees and um, basically do a gesture, get some movement in there, figure out where everything is going to go, um, and translate up anything that I found in my, um, in my compositional study that I've hopefully done before this. Um, then I want to block in some of these, um, the locations of some of these like large areas of foliage and stuff like that. There's a big one up at the front left and then there's one in the middle ground kind of on the right and then there's like a little one in the background as well. Um, so I'm going to take just a, a general approach to this, a, a kind of like tonal approach to this and it's going to be a little bit different. You can see as I've marked out here there are about 11 values in this um, in this study that that this person's having trouble with, um, and so it's basically sort of overcomplicating everything. And so when you overcomplicate any given step, it's really hard to um, make any progress. And yeah, that's definitely going to be frustrating. Everyone would get frustrated with that. Um, so what I like to do is for the for the four values, you know, black, dark gray, light gray, and white, I like to go ahead and, and put the same value over the black and the dark gray for the first kind of pass through the image. Um, and it's not even going to be like a really dark dark, it's just going to be a tone. Um, and I don't want to like get into too many details or discriminating one area from another, or distinguishing one area from another. I just want to get the tone down. Um, once I get the tone down, then I can start to differentiate. You don't have to worry about line direction. You don't have to worry about anything but just building up this um, this tone. So as I progress through that, I'm kind of thinking about, all right, where am I going next? I'm going to differentiate the black and the dark gray from each other, right? I want to get specific about kind of where those begin to separate um, and I can start to sort of push that value down. If the black probably isn't going to wind up being a hundred percent black but we're just using that for the sake of argument here. Um, and in this case this foreground tree is going to get um, the black tone, the uh, middle ground tree is going to get kind of the dark gray tone, the ground is going to get um, a black tone over it. And so what we're trying to do is like if you squint at it, we're just compressing the values, right? Whenever I'm outside and drawing landscapes, I'm constantly squinting out at the world, trying to simplify what I see down to the barest essence. Um, if I take in all of the light, it just gets overwhelming how much detail there is out there that I could potentially put into the drawing. Um, another reason for that is when you take a glance at your finished product, um, the 
overall value is what's going to hit you. It's going to be like the punch to the drawing, the, the thing that draws you in from across the room. The detail, the texture, and the execution of any individual piece of the drawing is what's going to keep you there once you go across the room to look at it. So I always go back and forth between squinting and looking at detail, squinting, looking at the whole thing, going back in, working on like specific areas of detail so that I can maintain the overall punch while accomplishing the task of getting the, the detail in that I want and creating sort of a convincing landscape. One of the things that um, the study kind of does a little bit weird is it creates these like little vertical hatch marks and, and so the ground kind of feels like this um, strange like progressively lighter value scales that kind of like goes back in space um, and it doesn't have much um, much horizontality to it or much feel like that's um, like a solid ground that you could walk into the painting and, and uh, step on. And again, this is just a this is just a process, real quick, of building up value. Um, this is kind of like a little bit of muscle work. Drawing digitally, this process is basically exactly the same in analog. If you're working on pencil and paper, you're going to do this exact sort of thing. You'll just get more nuance out of uh, pencil and paper than uh, you would drawing digitally, um, and I think for me the main idea is, is you know what process you're using and how you're thinking about drawing rather than what specific tools you use to get there. Um, so here I'm going in with some light grays, kind of getting some far distance ground, got some light gray um, areas, and then the back I've kind of left white as kind of this light that's kind of seeping through the trees. Um, I think that's an interesting composition because it feels like you're inside uh, the forest and you're like kind of like looking out through this web of trees right onto the edge of the forest where it's just so bright and your eyes haven't adjusted to it at all. Um, I think that's a fascinating um, effect of light. So if we go back to the study, um, there's kind of a a missing concept from it. Um, and that concept has, has a lot to do with the way that the trees interact with the ground. If you look where the trees interact, you see that the tree is basically this sort of vertical thing and it sort of stops and then there's some grass texture that sort of overlaps the bottom of it. Um, and I don't think that's a really effective way to go about it, right? Essentially, you have this opportunity to show off how the tree interacts with the ground, but you're hiding it behind these sort of vertical hatch marks. Um, there's some indication of the ground, as you can see, with kind of where the values are going, um, but they're not sp like specific and related to the trees. So clearing out that layer, um, we're going to switch to a different tool so I can kind of show this off a little bit better. Um, I've got a pen out and um, work on this idea of, of how the tree interacts with the ground. In elementary school, you take the tree trunk, you draw its contour, and then you throw some lines across it. And then maybe you just draw a line there, like on either side, and that's your ground, right? And that's how the tree interacts super flat, right? Doesn't emphasize form, there's no depth to it, it's, it's very um, shape oriented. So our ninja way of doing it, that, and where we want to head with this, is to think about these roots going under the ground and keeping the ground there, keeping it from eroding, um, remembering intellectually that a tree is usually just as big underground as it is above ground, um, and then building on that. Um, and we can use those little ridges and continue them on to other trees and, and we can go from there. 
one of the interesting things about tree trunks is that they tend to kind of preserve their roots. They're not like round when you look on them. You can see like each root kind of pushes out and becomes part of the trunk. And then as it grows up, it, it, it tends to spiral because trees follow the light and the light's in a slightly different position year round. Trees, the roots also come towards you. They go away from you. So with one tree, you can describe a huge area around it on the ground. And I just call this concept grounding because it sort of makes sense. Um, and it's easy to remember that way. Um, one of the more interesting things about this kind of concept is that when I go in with, with other trees, um, the, the, the grounding concept can create some overlap and some depth. So if we go out and we start drawing another tree here, um, and we start overlapping these lines, by creating this overlapping, we create depth. Overlapping is the simplest way to create depth. What we're also doing is we're describing the ridges on the ground. So we're giving you more visual information about like what these trees are sitting on top of and how that ground kind of undulates um, and and maybe where water would run if, if this were like uh, in the middle of a rainstorm. Another thing you can do is you can use um, your sort of wrapping cylindrical lines to describe the roots and you can kind of create some concavity in the um, in the trunk by wrapping lines sort of the other direction. You can kind of wrap lines uh, in a cross-section way around the tree trunk itself to describe its depth. Um, and then as you go up into the branches, these kinds of root structures will eventually become branches and they'll kind of fork off on their own. Sometimes they'll project, project towards you, sometimes they'll go away from you, and they'll go in all kinds of different crazy directions. One of the um, more interesting things about uh, trees is that the angle of the fork where it breaks off is usually pretty constant and it changes from tree to tree. So um, that angle will be repeated every time any branch breaks off from the tree and it'll be re repeated all the way down to each leaf and to the veins within each leaf. So um, if you wanted to create distinct trees and tree types, you can look at that angle and by changing the angle according to what species of tree it is, you can, without giving a lot of detail, um, you know, create different sort of tree types in your environment um, as you're doing a landscape. And as you go back in space and you ground more trees, that overlapping just stacks up. And you can create a whole lot of depth just by looking at the ground and how the, um, how the trees interact with the ground. Um, picking up a watercolor tool here, I can kind of go through and change some values um, each time I have like a section of ground that overlaps and that very quickly can create this um, illusion of depth and emphasize what I've been doing with the um, with the line work and the overlapping um, and that can be a real quick way to create um, a somewhat convincing landscape um, so what we're talking about here is uh, a different thought process behind this landscape and if I continue to develop this sort of um, this sort of idea I can go right up into the trees and use that same sort of concept I can um, block in some areas um, with some darks leave some light areas and I can get a real quick um, value sketch and you know I, I personally love the combination of wash and line um, because you know, that kind of like fits my preference for um, showing a form through line. Now there are other ways that you can um, approach this. The biggest concept that you want to get across in landscape is atmospheric perspective. And most of the time when we talk about atmospheric, perspect atmospheric perspective, people will say, oh, things get lighter as they go back, right? There's atmosphere in the way, everything looks more pale, looks more desaturated. And that kind of is true um, for the most part, 
but what's really happening is that contrast brings things forward and low contrast pushes things back. So we're going to go in with like an oil paint tool here um, and just kind of throw down some, some paint and uh, be real loose with it, real messy, and see what we can, what we can turn up with. Um, I'm just going through again, reestablishing kind of what we learned from the study. So now this is like the third time I've kind of taken a crack at this, or really I guess the second. Um, so now I kind of know where all these values are going to go, and I still stick to that basic like four value structure before expanding it any further, right? Just using black, dark gray, light gray, white. Um, and one of the things that we're going to do here in a second is we're going to kill all of the white. We're going to just cover up this whole area. And um, because what happens when you're trying to work with value is that if you have too much white space or too much dark, um, you can't really see how those values are going to operate. If you go, if you get a kind of a tone over everything like we're doing now, that that's going to really help you see the power of what a little bit of like pure white and pure black can do. Um, and this is kind of an essential stage that seems like, you know, taking two steps back in your painting or your drawing just to fill in some space. Um, but it's really helpful. You know, here there's still like too much white because I have all these little flecks coming through. So I'm going to just real messily take this blending tool and like blend out all that, um, all that stuff. And it's going to look really bad for a while and that's fine. Um, because I'm trying to get this, uh, this stuff kind of just covered up. I'm covering the canvas. You know, my drawing teacher used to say like 90% of drawing is covering the paper and like in a way that's kind of true, right? Because what happens to a lot of drawings is that you know you don't get dark enough, you don't finish the drawing, you don't um, do enough to it, and um, that kind of creates a lot of problems in the long run. So here um, we're going to go in with like a super dark black for this this um, front tree here. It's in the foreground, and then we're going to take um, the extreme white and put it right on the trunk with it and it's going to look really bad um, at first because they're not really like integrated with each other and they're not like the correct values that you would normally use but this will illustrate the concept really well um, now that i've done that you'll notice that this tree like literally pops out of the landscape it pops so far forward Right. You read those two values as part of the same tree because they're going the same direction and everything. And it just wants to come forward in front of everything. Um, I can help it out by kind of like grounding it a little bit and integrating it with um, the bottom of the landscape. But still, it has so much contrast it wants to come really far forward. Now I'm going to do the opposite. In the back, for this background tree, I'm going to take a very low contrast value. <coughs> it is. It has a minimal difference from that background tone that we've created. And then I can shift the value by just a couple of steps and get some a little bit of detail into that tree in the background and um, go another step darker and get even more detail. And so here I'm working with basically like three value steps they're not very far apart, they're really close together, but it still looks tree-ish, right? And so I've done the opposite. I've done low contrast and high contrast. And if I start working back into the foliage, right, and creating that high contrast look, it's going to kind of integrate the tree a little bit better, but it's still going to look pretty rough <coughs> because there's, you know, too, too much contrast. I'm using the full range. I'm using 0 and 10, right? So that's going to kind of disintegrate things even further for a minute. Um, one of the things to do after this is to kind of go back into the middle ground, right? So here, if I tone down that contrast, 
that changes that changes everything, right? If I start to bring this tree together into like a more reasonable contrast range, um, it starts to to sit within the landscape a little bit more. Now I'm also kind of fighting this blended texture and stuff, but it um, that will disappear as we go further in with it. So here, if I blend out some white, I'm kind of like knocking down the contrast in the, in the foreground, but still preserving a good amount of contrast more than in the background. <coughs> so if we go in here with um, a kind of formula, right? If we think of the background as using like one to three values, right? That's probably a good formula or one to three value steps. We're talking range, right? It could be it could be like really dark or really light or somewhere in the middle, as long as that range of values is small. In the middle ground, we can think of it like two value steps to like seven value steps, say. Um, so that could be like the brightest bright and like a dark gray. It could be like black down to like a light gray, as long as there's like a range there. And in the foreground, if we think of like five to 10 steps, so if we go from like middle gray to, to black, or middle gray to white, or like light gray to dark gray, or even the full value range, like that is kind of what's gonna make things sit in the foreground. So here, let's add a middle ground tree, right? We've got this one on the right that's like gonna be easy to integrate. And we'll increase the amount of contrast within the tree itself to achieve that. <coughs> so if we go in with like kind of a middle dark gray, that'll kind of begin to um, establish the tree. And as we darken out those values and create a bigger contrast range, right? You see, if you squint at it, the contrast range of the foreground of the foreground tree is really big. The contrast range of the background tree is really small. And if you squint at the middle ground, the contrast is like somewhere in between the two, right? It doesn't have the contrast of the foreground tree, but you can see it more clearly because of the contrast uh, than the than the background tree. And it only takes a few of these marks to kind of begin to have the tree sort of like come together and pull together. Um, now, what you want to do is you kind of want to like mentally assign some of the other trees in here as being part of the part of the background, foreground, or middle ground. And as you go add them in, you can use if you establish one of each, then you can use that as the guide to adding more trees in there. Um, because now you know which values are kind of working for you and which aren't. So when I go in and begin to add more, um, more detail, um, and add more trees, that's going to be really easy because I've got that stuff established already. So I can roll in, I can add some, some ground plane stuff, mix in some concepts. <coughs> so we've got several concepts going on now. We've, we're adding in the grounding concept, we're adding an atmospheric perspective, and we've um, covered up the value um, so that these whites are going to really work for us when we put them in. You know, we're not going to work too much on color, but this is kind of what is going to set you up for color. You could theoretically do a color overlay over this and do the colors transparently and that would preserve all the value that you've that you've done and maybe we'll do that in another like kind of demo video um, just to see what happens so if i go through and put in sort of more of these trees you know i'm using atmospheric perspective I'm using a little bit of linear perspective and the, the trees kind of like they narrow as they go back to like um <coughs> and I'm kind of getting to the point where this landscape is starting to look more landscapey, right? Um, one of the fun effects that we had earlier on was the idea of uh, real dark values in the front. So bringing some of those back is going to be critical. 
and then um, coming back into the back and getting some some more low contrast trees is going to be good too. Um, and they can be a real sketchy kind of leave the mind to fill it more than uh, actually draw it out. The one thing that was kind of missing from the study and that we kind of need to put in there is a horizon line, right? It's like the most critical part of landscape is sort of looking out into the landscape and seeing the horizon. So if we go in and kind of roughly pick where that horizon is going to be, that's going to help us. Another thing that we can do is take some of these whites, that's what I'm doing now, and uh, put some whites in there as if the light is like shining through the trees and there's some gaps in the trees. Um, and you can kind of see through some foliage, so you're looking into the far distance and this, and this kind of light is hitting you through the trees. Um, that kind of effect, I think, is uh, really powerful and really strong and um, kind of missing on a lot of landscapes. So here I'm coming in with the horizon um, and using that white to kind of establish where that is because um, I'm imagining that low on the horizon um, you'd be able to see through the trees better than sort of like looking up um, because if you look up there's going to be a lot of like branches, leaves and such and there's not going to be as much light coming through. So here essentially we've got a pretty decent landscape and if you if you squint at it, right, that's going to show you what's really going on with the landscape. Um, you can kind of see the the atmospheric perspective idea at work if you if you squint, um, and you can see it kind of getting like punchy. And if we took the time to really develop this over a couple of hours, you can imagine what you can do with it. Um, you know, here we're working on like a like 15, 20 minute time scale. Um, and we're already getting this sort of stuff established. So I'm curious what to see, or curious to see what what uh, what you can achieve with uh, a couple of simple ideas and, and a good amount of time.